we going to do an exercise session? Uh, maybe 15 minutes or so, we, we need to discuss what you know and what you don't know. Now, uh, the question is, uh, yeah, maybe I can just test, test it a little bit now. Uh, uh, so, it was proved that Brownian motion is conformally invariant in the first term, yes? Uh, with stochastic calculus that you just, yeah, okay. Uh, now, uh, so Wendelin defined SLE. Uh, and uh, did not very rigorously some statements about it or how, so uh, did, did he prove what is dimension of a silly or, no? No, not, not, no. Rigorously. not rigorously. Okay, let me think. Uh, and uh, one more thing, so there is, um, so I was thinking of moving two Friday lectures to Monday while we don't have Monday course. Uh, because there are two lectures which I, uh, when I'll be away. So is it okay with everyone if uh, Monday? Okay, then I, I, I need first to check the schedule and when it is okay. Okay, so are we waiting for anyone? No, we're not waiting. Okay. Yeah, okay, off we go then. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I decided uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, so the, so I, I decided that before going to the course, I'll just uh, show some pictures and uh, browse uh, through the slides of colloquium talk. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then the rest of the course will be the usual one with the theorems on a blackboard. Uh, so I'll just uh, sort of show what, what I want to do today to put it in the proper perspective and uh, uh, show a few pictures and basically announce what we are going to do. Uh, so uh, the title is Conformal Invariance of Lattice Models. Uh, and <coughs> I mean, first of all, in English, you can't really say just lattice model, you should say model of something. So what do we mean by lattice models, like easing model, percolation model, that uh, easing, it's a easing model of uh, ferromagnetism, or percolation is a model of uh, water seeping through some medium. Uh, so that's that's sort of the first first remark, and uh, it's uh, rather uh, mm, interesting that uh, first such discrete models were actually proposed in a rigorous a rigorous way by ancient Greeks without any sort of scientific reason to do so, just from uh, mental experiment. So. Uh, like half of ancient Greek philosophers, they thought that uh, matter consists of atom, and they actually, uh, Democritus wrote that maybe that's the reason for phase transition of water boiling, that the individual atom, they change their behavior continuously, but when you take them together, it, it might add up to something. Uh, and uh, it was more or less at this level till, uh, well, early 20th century, so the first rigorous application of uh, statistical mechanics is the Einstein's paper about Brownian motion. So he proposed a random walk, a discrete model as a model for Brownian motion. And so it's, it's a bit eclipsed. He has two more papers that year, one of them about relativity uh, and uh, uh, well, special relativity, and, uh, uh, which, which is more famous. Uh, but uh, this is actually a very, uh, very interesting paper in the sense that we'll come to that later. So uh, he, sa uh, he says that, uh, basically he writes that uh, we have, oh, by modern standard, it's sort of mathematical content of it, it's not very difficult. But it's interesting the relation to physics. So he, uh, so people observed motion of small particles inside grains of pollen. So usually in biology textbook they write that grains of pollen move erratically, but it's not grains of pollen, but inside grains of pollen you have small particles which move erratically. And uh, uh, it was proposed by some people that the reason for this erratic movement is that there are molecules which we don't see in the microscope. They bump into these grains which we see in the microscope and force them to jump around. And uh, one must understand that at the end of 19th century, more than half of physicists didn't believe in molecules or atoms. So they, they, many thought that the matter is continuous or it's discrete in some other way. Uh, what Einstein observed that if we assume that there are atoms and uh, we assume that uh, they move erratically and they bump into our grain of pollen, then the grain of pollen will exhibit a sort of random walk and since these jumps are minuscule, so we look at random walk very far away, we'll get a continuous phenomenon like uh, 
what was later defined rigorously by Wiener and was called Wiener process or we call Brownian motion. But the more importantly, Einstein observed that actually you can calculate with which speed and how it will move. So not only, uh, well, he sort of exhibited that it should in time t move square root of t away, but the constant in front can be calculated from several parameters. So for example, the bigger the grain of pollen is, the more often molecules bump into it. And basically it's proportional to surface area, which is square of the size of the grain. The size of the grain we see in the microscope. Now molecules, you can consider them point masses because they are much smaller, uh, but the number of bumps uh, will be all proportional to the number of molecules in, uh, in this volume, the Avogadro number. And then uh, the speed, uh, the size of uh, jumps will, be, will, be, will depend on temperature monotonously. So the higher temperatures, the, higher, better, the f faster molecules move. So basically what he did, he wrote a formula from Brown and Motion which relates uh, five constants which all you me can measure numerically uh, and you get an identity and then you measure them and you get that actually it agrees with high precision. So uh, fairly as it was done and it was the first uh, scientific uh, uh, proof of uh, so statistical mechanics, basically it's the first serious paper in statistical mechanics and uh, uh, of lattice models and uh, it's the first scientific proof uh, that uh, there are indeed atoms. But it's, it's a proof in the same way we, we have an observation of Higgs boson that we don't actually see atoms, but uh, uh, we uh, basically assume that they exist and then we write a formula and then we check this formula experimentally and it holds. Uh, so there are many models uh, of many phenomena since and uh, many of them are fairly simple to formulate yet uh, they turn out to be accurate. So uh, uh, essentially, well, for example, these are two things which will uh, touch a little bit uh, upon. Uh, so on the left, there is a, uh, there is a simulation of erosion on, done on computer, but you can, of course, also observe it in nature. Uh, and uh, what physicists observe experimentally that if you, if you have erosion in the plane, uh, for example, if you what you can do, you can light a forest fire in the forest and see which, which patch will burn out and how, uh, and, or you can drop uh, some acid on, a, on the surface of the table and e look at which, which shape it will burn in the surface of the table. So it turns out that if you, if you uh, start even with something regular, you always get this sort of fractal shapes. So in, in the forest you get a fractal uh, boundary of what is burned out. Well, of course, I mean, if forest ends at a railroad, it burns all the way to railroad, you get a straight boundary. But if it stops somewhere in the middle of a forest, the boundary will be fractal. And physicists actually observed experimentally that the boundary will, be, will have Hausdorff dimension for thirds. Uh, now, there is a model of this for which physicists uh, uh, related by hand waving to percolation, which is a model of another phenomena, uh, where again for thirds was conjectured numerically, and then it was hand wavingly related to. Uh, not even hand waving, just by looking at it. So Benoit Mandelbrot looked at these pictures, but he also looked at uh, the picture of, of this thing, which is a uh, big polymer molecule in, in some environment. And uh, so actually, we can start later if you wish. What do you think? Should we start 9.30 or for me it's okay. Yeah. So. Uh, so just let's, let's, let's just dis decide later on some time when we start so that no one is late. Okay? Okay. So uh, uh, then, um, so uh, uh, for one of these things, uh, so for this thing, well, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, yeah, I, I lied a bit. So there, there, is, there is another model for which Mandelbrot conjectured that it's the same dimension for thirst just by looking at and comparing it uh, like you can compare these two curves, actually the boundary of this looks similar to position of a, a molecule in the dilute solution. Uh, so it's just you think about, uh, uh, so when, when we write polymer chains in chemistry, in chemistry when uh, you read a book you write a chemical formula and usually don't think how it positioned in the space, uh, which actually might, might, be, uh, might be quite important. Uh, so for example Curie who, who made uh, well big, 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 big contribution uh, 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 no, not Curie, the, um, 
the past two Pasteur, uh, who, who made big contribution to our hygiene by, by invading pasteurizing milk. So in his PhD, he observed that uh, for, the, for the tartaric acid, uh, you can have uh, two different forms. So the molecule can be the left-oriented to right-oriented, though chemical form is the same. Uh, and uh, what happens is that the tartaric acid you see in nature, it polarizes light because nature for uh, some reasons related to DNA creates only left-oriented molecules. But if you create in a lab, you have 50-50 of two, or actually even uh, you have 40% of one, 40% of another, and there is also a symmetric version. And then it doesn't polarize light. It, rather, it polarizes light, but it, one poly molecule polarizes one way, another, another, and it cancels out. Uh, but uh, it gets even more complicated if you have long molecules because they uh, might be the same, but they might be positioned differently. So, for example, your DNA is about two meters long and it fits inside one cell, which is obviously smaller than two meters. Uh, so, it's, it is somehow knotted, uh, and uh, there is a special chemical or biological mechanism how it's unknotted during replication and how it's unwinded and apparently it stores some information. So, uh, this particular thing about about DNA, we, it's uh, not yet within the reach of statistical mechanics. But uh, for example, how if molecule is uh, unknotted, that, that sort of things which, 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 which people discuss. Now I want to briefly uh, speak about the physical history, prehistory of conformal invariants, so that's just the same thing. Uh, so uh, what uh, we will speak about uh, are theorems for the, from the last 15 years. Uh, and uh, it's uh, essentially not, uh, we don't understand the field very well. So there are four, maybe five cases when we prove that something is conformally invariant. There is no general theory and certainly there is a lot of work to be done. I'm not sure how difficult it is. It might be that someone gets lucky, writes a proof on 10 pages. It's not excluded that people, uh, existing proofs, most of them, the ide ideas are quite short and uh, self-contained. Uh, but uh, what is maybe more depressing, we don't see how a unified theory can, can be um, approached. And before that, for about 30 years, there was conformal field theory in physics, which didn't have geometric or analytical part, but it had algebraic part, which is perfectly rigorously mathematical. So, for example, the number four thirds is the dimension of this curve. Uh, physicists obtained it, but they obtained it as a weight in certain representation uh, of certain algebra. But, and then they had conveying that it might be related to Hausdorff dimensions, but they never did it rigorously on, on a rigorous level, even on physically rigorous level. Now, the other thing uh, I must comment uh, on is that uh, we'll be speaking only about two dimensions. i later say a few words why only about two dimensions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it was thought till very recently that uh, there is no conformal invariance in dimension 3D, and if there were, it wouldn't have been interesting. Now there, are, there is a series of papers where the main guy is Slava Rechkov, who is now works at CERN and moves next year to Ecole Normale, uh, where they assume, so he's a physicist, he works at CERN, uh, so he assumes that Ising model in 3D is conformally invariant, and he cannot get spectacular prediction as in 2D that some exponents are like for thirds or some nice rational numbers, but he can calculate using this assumption exponents with arbitrary precision. So he can prove that exponent belongs to some interval, however small. So they can do, so he did like seven digits after the comma and the other people did 15 digits. So there is a iterative procedure, you solve some equation, then you solve it again, it's sort of bootstrap. And so, so there are some applications of conformal invariance 3 d This is uh, beyond mathematical understanding yet, but in principle it, it, it might be interesting. And there, is, there are some important differences, maybe, maybe I'll say later about it. Now, the archetypical model of physics, so, so there was a big discussion of Ising model in the first, yes? Yes, yeah. So the Ising model was actually proposed by Lenz, so there is this running joke uh, that uh, models uh, in physics, stat statistical mechanics, you name after your students. So Ising was student of Lenz, and uh, there is Potts model, Potts was student of Domp, so Domp introduced Potts model and named it Potts model. And then Castellin introduced Fortin Castellin model and named it after his student Fortin, but added his name also. So um, <clears throat> basically, uh, 
the, the Lenz introduced uh, the model saying that uh, we assume, uh, so it's, it's, it's very interesting if you look today at his papers because uh, he has like completely wrong logic uh, and uh, yet he gets a fairly correct model. So he assumed that atoms are small depots. Uh, it's not clear what he thought at the moment. Maybe he thought that uh, you have electron which is like goes in circular orbit, so it's like electric current running around the circle, and that creates a magnetic field. So that indeed uh, angular momentum creates a very small magnetic field, but the actual magnetic field of electron, uh, which is his, its intrinsic property because it has a spin, it's about 100 times stronger. So this, this, this moment about which he thought it doesn't play important role in most materials, and the one uh, which is really behind uh, at the time was not known to exist. Uh, so what, uh, 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 what he argued is that depending on temperature, uh, so if there are thermal fluctuations, then uh, these depots are less likely to align. And if, if they align, you have a magnet. If they not aligned at high temperature, then they ca the magnetic fields cancel out and you don't have magnetic uh, material. So uh, what we know by now is that his argument was flawed, but uh, by and large model was correct. So there is a theorem in physics which states that uh, you need to have quantum mechanics to have phase transitions like magnetic phase transition. So if you have a classical solid without quantum mechanics, it's either always magnetic or always non-magnetic. So if you have phase transition and in magnets uh, which we see in nature, there is phase transition. So if you hit a piece of iron to uh, 1,000 degrees uh, Kelvin grade, it stops being a magnet. Uh, but uh, that, that is hard to try at home. You need uh, like a plasma torch at least. Uh, but uh, if you, so I have some neodymium magnets uh, in my office, so we can, we can try it with the light. So they have uh, critical temperature about 100 degrees. So I, I can bring after, after the break. So we hit them with the light and they stop being magnets. And that's the magnets which are used in hard drives. Or if you have magnetic clip on your wallet, that's the magnets which are used. And they, they are basically the strongest which uh, are known today. Uh, Engineers discovered them about 20, 30 years ago. They're different alloys, and they're really strong. So I tried even with a small one. If you rub it on a credit card, it demagnetizes it. So it's, uh, if you have a bigger one like that size, you're just putting it in a wallet with a credit card, demagnetizes it. But on the other hand, they have very small critical temperature, so you observe it uh, but with, with the lighter. And um, as, 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 as essentially, uh, the reason uh, behind this uh, are two properties of quantum mechanics and one that electron is indeed like a small magnet at the pole, so it has a property of spin uh, which makes it a small dipole. And then there is a Pauli exclusion principle which uh, roughly states that two electrons can be in the same uh, space at the same time, or more mathematically it says that uh, you just calculate all possible orbits and you see how much energy each of them takes and you take the most energy efficient thing. And it turns out that in certain configurations, the most in, in certain, it depends on the lattice, it depends on electronic clouds, but in, for many lattices, it's just most energy, energy efficient the spins are aligned. Uh, and uh, so if there is a low temperature, then they are all aligned. If there is a high temperature, the thermal fluctuations start destroying it and you stop having a magnet. Now, uh, the lens easing model, so this, this is what you have seen, so this is like a generic picture. So one has to understand that it's <laughs> not a quantum mechanics model. So the origin why we introduce this model is quantum mechanics. So the two squares try to be of the same color because of two quantum mechanics principles. So, but the model we have classical. There is a quantum version of easing model, quantum easing model. I don't know whether Ivan mentioned it in his course, no. So there is a quantum version of easing model, which, for example, you can do looking at development of time in easing model and how the spins flip, or you can put more complicated spins than plus minus one. Uh, we won't discuss it. Uh, there is a general principle that uh, quantum model in dimension uh, two is the same as classical model in dimension three, or quantum model in dimension one is the same as classical model in the plane. So we are discussing classical model in the plane, so we're discussing easing model uh, on a square. So you can look at it as a quantum easing model on a line. So you can imagine, for example, a metallic wire which is uh, supercooled in liquid helium. And then what, what you see, you, you see uh, kind of time development, uh, how, how spins flip. And then you will see more or less this picture which is equivalent to two-dimensional easing model. 
So uh, physicists, when they want to make experiments on two-dimensional using water, instead they often do, they take a piece of fire and they put it in liquid helium and experiment on quantum, quantum one-dimensional using model. Now, um, so that was very well discussed by Velenik, so usually, usually people write that, etc., etc. So uh, easing, uh, so that, uh, that there is no phase transition dimension one Velenik discussed, yes? Yeah, so that's the Easing's contribution that uh, there is uh, no phase transition in dimension one and uh, 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 essentially uh, how he did it, he went uh, left to right on this chain and uh, basically you see that probability to C plus here, it doesn't depend on the whole past but only on the probability what is the previous spin. And then you, you can write easily, using, using binomial formula, you can easily write all the probabilities. So it's in a sense, uh, uh, so you cannot write similar formulas in dimension 2D, but you can try to do uh, the same trick, uh, moving left to right in 2D by cutting your model by a line and uh, saying that what is to the right of the line doesn't depend on what is to the left, but only on the line itself. But the difficulty is that if you <coughs> cut here, you just have to store one spin, but if you cut a square at a line, you have to store, well, the number of spins, which is the width of the square. So instead, for example, here you, uh, this done correctly, is done with matrices two by two, which probably uh, Vilinik did. Uh, but if you do it, uh, uh, if you do it, if you have a square of width 100, then there are two to the power 100 different configurations of spins which is roughly a million. So you have to do with matrices million by million because depending on configuration of spins, you can reduce probability of the next configuration. And that becomes very difficult. So that in principle could have been part of his course because uh, there are books about it and there is a big theory how to work with these matrices. They call transfer matrices or R matrices and maybe the most famous is Baxter's book. So uh, this was uh, one of the precursor of conformal field theory. So I'll say a bit more about it later. So the other contribution of Ising was that he uh, writes uh, in his paper that there is no phase transition in dimension two and three and people actually did believe him. So he writes that his method works in dimensions two and three uh, and there is no phase transition there. And as a result, uh, other people like Heisenberg, Dirac, they wrote papers proposing other models for magnetism. Uh, and uh, Ising never worked on this, uh, this paper anymore, so he was Jewish uh, and he barely escaped Nazis in Germany. And first he moved to Denmark, then he moved to United States and spent all rest, so somehow war destroyed his career. He spent the rest of his life teaching physics in a small community college in the United States. And accidentally in the 50s he learned that his model became famous. So, uh, so it became famous essentially in three steps. So first, uh, Pyros proved that in dimension two, there is, uh, there is a phase transition. So this is a slide from a popular talk. So this is maybe a more kind of uh, influential contribution of Pyros. So people usually say that Manhattan Project was started by a letter by Einstein and Seward that you want to create a nuclear bomb. But this letter was more or less dismissed by government because there they miscalculated the critical mass. They wrote the critical mass of plutonium is about five tons and they actually use in their letter that one should build a big nuclear bomb, put it on a ship uh, and sail the ship say to Hamburg and blow, blow Germany to, to pieces. Uh, so that was already the onset of war. But that sounded a bit like, uh, like macabre sounds science fiction. And then uh, what uh, Pyrus did with Otto Frisch, he actually did the better back of the envelope calculation which gave him five or seven kilos and that Actually, the pay, they wrote it to British authorities, then it was passed to Americans, and then that started the nuclear, the nuclear, the Manhattan Project. So, uh, did Velenik do Pyro's argument that there is a phase transition? So, okay, so we skip it. Uh, so, basically, this is uh, what happens uh, with in dimension two, and uh, this will be uh, some start, our starting point for the easing model so that Velenik must have shown you. So here there are four pictures for uh, high temperature, critical temperature and low temperature and the boundary conditions are Dabrushan boundary conditions. So it's red behind the equator, uh, be, uh, beneath the equator and blue above equator. So when uh, there is low temperature, everyone tries to be of the same spin. Uh, and when there is high temperature, everyone just is for himself. Uh, so, um, 
what uh, phase transition means is that we don't change continuously from left to right, but rather there is one point when we have this picture, and then there is a whole interval when we have this, and the whole interval when we have these caps. So the subject of this course uh, are mostly these two pictures, because in them there is some conformal invariance, which we are actually going to prove. Now, uh, this picture was fully analyzed, uh, and this is the so-called Ornstein Zenecki theory, so there the best theorem belongs to Ivan Velinik and Sharp Pfister. So for low temperature, for this picture, it's known that uh, this thing tries to be straight. Uh, and if the temperature is actually zero, it is actually straight. Uh, if the temperature is positive, it looks like a function. So it doesn't, it doesn't have kind of, uh, it doesn't wiggle. It it's really looks like a graph of a function. And it actually looks like a graph of a one-dimensional random walk. So if domain size is n, the deviation is square root of n. So if domain is very big, you don't see the deviations. So this is understood very well, but it's, 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 it's like a completely different thing. I don't think it was, probably one didn't discuss it in the course, or did he? No? No. So, the, so, so this is a different regime, and there is, uh, but there is conformal invariance in the two others. Uh, and, um, the study of two others, uh, it was basically studied, started by two papers. So first, uh, uh, after Pyrus observed there is a phase transition, paper, people start looking for the point where it occurs. And uh, quite <laughs> surprisingly at the time, Kramer and Vanier actually found an exact formula. So that probably was in Velenik's course. Was it that uh, at critical temperature for easing on a square lattice can be calculated exactly? So if you write it, uh, so I wrote it as, as x, so x, so uh, x is exponent of beta divided by temperature. So temperature is actually, you have to take logarithm of this number. So this, this, this is the exact form. You can calculate to another lattices, for example, on hexagonal lattices, it's, uh, no, on triangular, it's one over uh, square root of three. So, um, so did Vilinik do high temperature expansion? and low temperature expansion, he did do. So, so basically, this, this, this is the, the calculation. So what you observe, uh, uh, so do you all remember it, or should I spend five minutes recalling? Because we will later we'll need it at one point. Should I spend five minutes recalling? Or have you seen it? No? Yeah, so yes. Well, OK, so if at least one person hasn't seen, so I will spend uh, five minutes. So basically, it's, it's a very elegant argument. Uh, and uh, what you do, so the appropriate way to see it, uh, so we, 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 uh, and, and did he do random cluster model and Fortu and Castellan map? No? Sorry? He got it. Ah, OK, very good. So, so basically, uh, what, what we do here, we um, define a new model which has more information. So uh, we, our model has spins at the vertices of the lights, plus and minus. But we also draw both edges uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on some of the both uh, bonds on some of the edges. So we get a picture which has more information. So it's like we have easing model, but we also, this is canonical mode of percolation. We draw some bonds. So it's kind of hybrid of easing model and percolation. And then um, <clears throat> what we observe is that uh, you can, uh, well, uh, what is the contribution of one bond in the easing model? If spins are different, it's equal to x. Uh, if spins are the same, it's equal to 1. There are only two possible values, x and 1. Or if you write in terms of spins, it's exponent beta and exponent minus beta. If there are only two possible values, you can always find y. Uh, y such that uh, uh, these values are proportional to 1 minus y and 1 plus y. So it's, you just solve, solve this equation, which is quadratic in y. And then you can rewrite uh, your product of x for all neighbors which are different as product of 1 plus y, spin f i, spin of j. When spins are different, you get 1 minus y, which corresponds to x. When spins are the same, you get 1 plus y. So it's not exactly the same partition function, but it's proportional by an exact coefficient, which is 1 plus y to the power number of bonds. And now here you can, using this new model, you can open up the brackets. And what you do when you put, uh, so there are two possible terms. You put term 1 for every thin edge and term y as i as j for every bold edge. So you open up and you get sum of, of all configurations y as i as j, where these terms are taken for bold edges. 
Now uh, we change the order of summations and first we sum over SIs and SJs. And how many times this spin figures out in this sum? Well, it figures out the same number of times the number of bold edges which go into it. So if there is only one bold edge, we have SI to the first power. And we sum for plus one and minus one, it cancels out. If we have three edges, it's SI cube. We sum for plus one and minus one, again, it cancels out. So only even powers remain. So all, all the pictures which remain are pictures where there are even number of bold edges through every point. So only pictures remain where uh, everything can be split into some number of bold loops. So picture like this one. And now uh, what basically happens then spins completely disappeared at sum over both edge configurations because spins we summed all of, the, all of them they disappeared. If, if spin is to the odd power it gives us zero. If it's to the even power it gives us one because you sum one to the four and minus one to the four. So it, it gives us one. So basically we get y to the power number of edges for such, such configurations. But such even configurations can be written as domain walls of using model on dual lattice. So there is basically one to one bijection between, uh, or one to two bijection. If, if you draw even edge configuration, you can fill everything with spin so that they change when you cross both edge. Uh, you only have to say what is the spin here and then you fill everything. Uh, so up to factor of two, so the choice of spin here, you get that partition function of this is equal to partition function of this. So up to factor two and factor one plus y to the power number of edges. So this is a relation of easing model on a lattice for temperature x to easing model on a dual lattice for temperature y. And uh, the equation is non-trivial, it's quadratic, and then you see that basically it's an involution of a real line, y goes to x, and there is exactly one fixed point. So it doesn't prove that the fixed point is critical, it proves that it's sort of self-dual, it proves that something interesting goes at it. But then you can compare some parameters of uh, to the left of it, they map with this bijection to different parameters above, and from that actually you can deduce that it is critical. So physicists immediately said that it means that it's critical, but, and it's, it's very interesting that mathematicians could have written a proof back in 60s, but somehow there was no mathematical proof, proof in, in the literature, so many people could have composed it from various physical papers. So this was observation of Kramer and Vanier, and then they did it for a number of other lattices. Uh, and uh, mm, that, that was already very interesting because uh, normally in physics, uh, critical temperature is, is a kind of, um, well, physicists don't care, care about critical temperature. So critical temperature of water is 100 degrees at sea level only because uh, we have, this is the definition of the number 100. So uh, for example, in Diablo Ray, if you go to Glacier, it's 90 degrees. And in the blurry downstairs, it's 94 degrees. So it takes more time to boil eggs. So if you want a nice egg here, you need three minutes. There you need five minutes. And in the glacier, probably it will be 10 minutes if it works at all, yeah, because it's really 90 degrees at 3,000 meters. So uh, it's, it's basically uh, uh, Curie temperature is random, uh, ra random transcendental number. So what is interesting for physicists is how phase transition occurs. So for example, for thirds, the dimension of a cluster is an interesting thing. But when you start percolation at which density of three, so which density of acid when you drop it on the table, that's not very interesting. It just there is some critical density, but what it is you can just uh, see experimentally interesting how it's going on. So here, it, on one hand, it wasn't very interesting for physics, it's interesting what's going on, but it opened, uh, if you know the critical temperature, you can study this regime exactly. Instead of saying that we choose x so that it is critical, we don't know x, but we only can use that x is critical in our uh, theorem. Uh, instead, we can plug in specific value and try to see what is going on. And then there, there, was, uh, there was a breakthrough by uh, Lars Anzager and then uh, uh, by Bruria Kaufman, and then they wrote paper together. And uh, so, so those are two very, very, very interesting persons. So Lars Anzager, uh, he was in Norwegian and uh, he defended PhD in Norway and then decided to come to United States. Uh, 
uh, in 30s. So he came to Yale as a professor of chemistry, and then it turned out uh, that, and he hanged out mostly with mathematicians and physicists, so he liked very much mathematics, and it turned out at one point that uh, he forgot to do some paperwork, he didn't have PhD, so chemist fired him as a professor of chemistry. And mathematicians immediately said that we just give him PhD in mathematics and hire him as a professor of mathematics, which didn't amuse chemists, so they rehired him back with PhD in mathematics. So he uh, was very powerful mathematically. He, he very famous in chemistry. He has Nobel Prize for the Reciprocity War. But he did several, uh, some mathematical contributions. And one of them was he actually solved two-dimensional easing model. Now, uh, did Ivan speak about this or not? Not. So bas basically what he did, uh, and it's, it's, again, it's a famous story that he was at the conference and after a talk someone asked, are there any questions? There was a talk about using model and then asked, are there any comments? And he says, yes, yeah, I can just write partition function of the using model. And he went to Blackboard and wrote the partition function. And then he published it a few years later. So for a few years, play, people were guessing uh, how did he write because the formula was, was, was correct. So essentially he, calculated uh, asymptotics of the partition function uh, in the easing model. Now, uh, what is the difference with, between one dimension and two dimensions? So in one dimension, it's very right, easy to write partition function. You go left to right, you multiply by one or by x, depending on you change spin or not. So if you sum all possible things, it's just one plus x times one plus x times one plus x. So it's one plus x to the power n, where n is the length. So this is, this is just the partition function of using model of length n, very easy. Uh, of course, uh, you can write uh, its exponent of something proportional to n, where n is the volume. In this case, it's length. So you expect the same thing in dimension 2, that it will be exponent of something proportional to volume, say, in a square n by n, n squared. So the question, what is the constant in front, how to calculate it? And the trick with 1 plus x to the power n doesn't work anymore. Because uh, if you just take 1 plus x to the power number of edges, uh, it will take uh, in some configurations which don't exist. So for example, for every square, if you go around square, when you start with plus spin, you arrive again to plus spin. Meaning that if you go around the square, uh, you change the spin even number of times. So if you, for a square, you write 1 plus x to the power 4, it will have extra terms like x cubed which uh, shouldn't be there because x cubed corresponds to changing spin thrice, and then you come from plus, you arrive to minus contradiction. So you can write binomial, obviously, in dimension two, but then most of the, th of the terms will be redundant, and it's not easy to, de to decide which, which ones are needed and which ones are not. So uh, solutions uh, which uh, now are numerous, and uh, uh, basically, what he did uh, is, is sort of a form of this moving left to right and looking at the boundary. And that requires, if you move in a box 100 by 100, uh, analyzing uh, what happens with matrices million by million, matrices 2 to the power 100 by 2 to the power 100. And if you go to infinite limit, it with infinite matrices. So uh, essentially, uh, uh, you need to do spectral theory for one dimensional using mode of matrix two by two, which is very easy, we told do this. And uh, 100 by 100 is still easy, but million by million more difficult. And, uh, but it turn, tends to infinity, and essentially the mathematical gap in the uh, reasoning, uh, in the physical reasoning is that uh, you do spectral analysis of infinite matrices. So you do spectral analysis of operators which a priori are not self-adjoint. And actually, in this case, they are, they are not, they are symmetric, so there are, there are some, some problems, but uh, the result is correct, and now there are independent ways to do it, and there are ways to do it with matrices where you actually commute these matrices out to, to be nice. Uh, and then it was uh, <coughs> observed by Bruria Kaufman, uh, uh, so, so she, she was a very inter interesting uh, person, so she was uh, one of the first women who got PhD in physics. Uh, uh, and uh, so it was around probably in the 40s. And before that, so it was very, very hard at the time to, uh, for, 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 for a girl to get, get into the university. And essentially, she worked as a secretary of several persons. She worked as a secretary of Einstein, then secretary of von Neumann, then, and, uh, 
she actually wrote, uh, wrote papers with most of these people. So she has a joint paper with Einstein, she has a joint paper with Anzagera, so uh, uh, like being, being, being basically secretary of Einstein. But, uh, but then it, it, uh, uh, fin finally she got a permanent job in Israel and uh, uh, worked there till, I mean, she died very recently, like late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and she's still a legend of Weizmann Institute because she was very, she had very hard opinions about everything. Uh, so at the time she, she was working in Princeton uh, University and uh, uh, Oprah, the Institute for Advanced Studies Secretary to Einstein and uh, she was at this talk and she uh, saw how one can uh, redo some of it with spinners. So now uh, spinner is a so we'll come to this later in one of the lectures. So it's in physics language, it's a fermion. In mathematics language, it's a, uh, or a, it's an it's a, it's an object which behaves like a differential form of fractional power, like square root of dz form, for example. So it's so basically, if you if you turn thing by 360 degrees, it multiplies itself by minus one. So uh, in modern language, physicists say that uh, everyone knows that two-dimensional Ising model is a free fermion, that it can be solved by writing it as a free fermion. And that's essentially her contribution. And then they wrote a couple of papers together. And that essentially unleashed uh, uh, the whole subject of uh, exactly solvable two-dimensional statistical mechanics. Uh, so uh, the usual thing which people say is that two-dimensional using model is integrable. So this is not exactly correct. So integrable, usually people say that PD is integrable if, uh, if there are infinite number of integrals of motion. I, I, I think you must have heard this. So it's, it's basically, so we know that most PDEs we cannot solve. So for example, we know, uh, we know how to solve uh, two-body problem for two planets, but we don't know how to solve three-body problem. And one of the ways to solve uh, two-body problems is that you write enough conserved quantities. So for example, energy of is uh, constant. So if you write enough of them, if your system, so for two planets, if you fix one, and the other has position which is six coordinates, if, if you have more than that of conserved quantities, then you just change coordinates to be these conserved quantities and you know everything. Uh, and um, so integrable are systems uh, which have infinite number of those. It's an area which was extremely active when it appeared in 60s and 70s and at one point people hoped that they can integrate all equations including Einstein's equations of gravity, young Mills equations uh, of physics, etc., etc. Uh, so what is uh, sort of surprising is that there are very non-trivial equations which are integrable. So for example, uh, some equations uh, for waves are integrable. Though uh, waves, uh, for example, there are these so-called things which are called standing waves or solitons. So there are sometimes in the ocean just a single wave that goes on and uh, people also model them in, in basins. So I, I have a colleague, a physicist, who they built in their years 200 meter long basin. They drop a concrete block at one end and then there is this wave which goes back and forth. Uh, and uh, so there are very non-trivial things where you can describe it mathematically exactly. So, uh, so this is very surprising. And then it's very surprising that not all equations are like that. So there are non-trivial equations like that, but not all others. So uh, here the word integrable is used usually by analogy. Uh, and also because there is some indirect, uh, so for example, Ising model is indirectly related to some integrable PDEs, but I cannot say that people really understand it very well. So there is, it's more like a dictionary which doesn't make much sense. So there is a like mapping. So this model is related to this PDE, this model to this. There is hierarchy of models, hierarchy of PDEs. So more, more uh, uh, and one of the ways to solve these models is related to these integrable systems. Now, um, more appropriate what is exactly solvable. So uh, for easing model to deduce this Anzager's formula, there are probably at least half a dozen solutions now, at least half of them rigorous. Uh, so dimers, uh, so David already started his course with on dimers. So uh, the, earliest rigorous, completely rigorous proof, I mean rigorous without uh, first that it's rigorous mathematically and also that doesn't have major mistakes, was with dimers. So Michael Fisher, famous physicist, he observed that you can write Ising model on square lattices dimers on some related graph. Uh, 
And diamonds back by then were sold already by Castellan for square lattice and for new graph it was not 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 very difficult. So this is the first first first. Uh, there are there is other solution. For example, there was Katz Schwartz, who Katz also was a famous mathematical physicist. So there was solution where they write using model as a collection of loops. So we already did this, but they they write as a collection of self-intersecting loops which are random walks and then. Uh, Vdovichenko in Russia found mistake in their proof. So the proof uh, goes putting bijection between set of loops and set of configurations of using models. So she observed that their bijection is not surjection. Luckily, it's not injection either. So actually, the two sets, they have the same cardinality, but uh, just what they exhibit is not better. So she corrected it with another mistake. And her solution with the mistake is in Landau Lifshitz's famous textbook on physics in the fifth volume. So there, the, like every physicist uh, who reads it, learns, learns the wrong solution with major, major combinatorial mistake. But, but the theorem, is, theorem is, is, is correct, and I think people finally fixed this solution like about 10 years ago, and I think David also has a, has a way, and David with Dima have a way to, to fix it. So, um, so what uh, is important to understand that uh, there is a large class of two-dimensional models, primary leasing, where many non-trivial things can be calculated exactly. Unfortunately, well, there are, and there are many methods to do so. But some are applied to only easing models, some apply to wider class, some are rigorous, some are not rigorous. So there is not uh, maybe a kind of encompassing theory. Uh, and uh, still, the work is there, is ongoing. And what we will speak about is one of the offshoots of this theory. So let's, let's have a break. Uh, now, uh, I have uh, two questions. So first, I already asked some. Uh, uh, first of all, I. I will be away twice on Fridays, and I wanted to move those Fridays to Mondays before we, we, we have the Monday course. Is it okay? Okay. Now, if uh, people are late en masse, shouldn't we start later? So at what time we should start so that people are not late? I, I also like to sleep, I mean, but, I, but I have two alarm clocks, so it's, and a mobile phone, so it's... Uh, <coughs> The problem of oversleeping is solved very easily with modern technology. Uh, so it's, uh, or do we start at 9.15? Okay, I take it that we, we try another time. Well, we, we again try to start at 9.15. So now uh, let's have 15 minute breaks. Uh, I, break, I, uh, I uh, show more pictures uh, and uh, tell how conform of field theory came to be. And then, then outline the plan, plan of the course. And ne from next time, we'll, uh, we will do it more rigorously. OK. Uh, OK. So um, so uh, let's, let's uh, may, may, maybe then uh, let us have lecture on Monday then, this Monday. So it's, it's, there is very small probability, I'm now trying to, to, because I was supposed to be elsewhere, but it got canceled, but there is still 2% probability that I have to go, but then, then Misha will have an extended exercise session, but so it's, but, uh, 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 so, so I, I, I think, uh, let us see, uh, maybe, maybe it just got solved. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we have lecture, lecture on Monday. Uh, so let's, uh, then uh, maybe the, uh, Mm. So the next next lecture, same room. Uh, so it's Monday, February. So is it 2016? Yeah, February 29th. Uh, then uh, Friday, uh, it's March 4th. One, two, three, four. Now, March 11th, I am away, so since we have this Monday, I think we can safely cancel it out. Uh, March 11th, so we just cancel it out. But let's maybe again have Monday 11, what is 12, 13, 14th. Monday, March, March 14th, and Friday, March, are you sure? Yeah. Well, and th 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 then, then we'll see. So we skip now, uh, because I know that I twice away on Friday, so this Friday goes, goes away and it becomes 
this Monday and then some other Friday to late. So it's, it's basically next week, Monday, Friday. Then for one week you have to digest whatever you heard this week. And then there is another week, Monday, Friday. And then, and then we'll see. Yeah. OK. Uh, so this exact solvability, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a very, very interesting area because uh, it's very interesting when you can calculate something uh, non-trivial exactly. And the shock which, which was uh, uh, at first was that, uh, what does it mean that you have a phase transition? It means that, for example, in using model that uh, uh, there is for high temperature zero magnetization and then at query point you get no negative magnetization. So magnetization is a non-smooth function. And you usually assume that whatever you can calculate exactly is smooth. Now, how, how this happens to be? Well, this happens to be in a very easy way that uh, if I choose, uh, if I have a finite volume, everything is smooth. So partition function for easing model on an interval of length n is polynomial of degree n. Partition function, which is easy to write. For square n by n, it's difficult to write, but it's still polynomial of degree at most twice n squared. That, that sort of order, it's how many bonds you have there. So it's some polynomial. So everything is smooth. Everything you can do is polynomial is smooth. But now when n goes to infinity, these polynomials tend to something non-smooth when you properly normalize them. And we know from Weierstrass theorem that any continuous function can be written as a limit of polynomials. So there is no, no contradiction that we get a non-smooth limit for behavior of magnetization. Uh, the only, there is rather not a contradiction, but a miracle that we can calculate exactly something non-smooth. Now, uh, so this is a very interesting area and David, David will speak about some calculations for dimers and dimers are sort of a very, very nice way. They are also a free ferment, so they're also equivalent to easing and um, I like it very much. And we'll also speak about them. Uh, but there are many, many, many other things and some of them it's, it's, it's a recurring topic of, uh, of a research. So for, for example, uh, just uh, Recently, there was a series of papers uh, by Baradin and others at MIT where they do fluctuations for height function for six vertex model, which, which we will discuss. And they do it not in conformal event regime, but in other regime. And they get KPZ fluctuation by using these old integrability techniques from 70s, but redoing them, them in a modern way. So it's, it's, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a very large area and several directions, but it's, it's not our, our main. Um, main topic of this course. Now the main topic of this course, it started after two developments post this area and one developer is renormalization group and it was actually invented here in Geneva by Stuckelberg. So Stuckelberg, I don't have his picture, I have a picture of Ken Wilson who got Nobel Prize uh, for, for renormalization group. So Stuckelberg, it's uh, sort of uh, interesting, uh, well exciting and sad story. So he like, uh, like uh, John Nash, uh, so he, he had some psychiatric problems, so he spent a significant part of his uh, life in psychiatric hospital, and at that time they were rather uh, brutal, so electroshocks and all that. Uh, and uh, so allegedly three people got Nobel Prizes for things he invented while he was in psychiatric hospital. No, while he invented them while he was out, but uh, so, uh, for example, Feynman got for Feynman diagrams, and some people say that Stuckelberg invented them, or he invented some sort of similar diagrams, and he invented the normalization group, uh, and <coughs> so, uh, uh, and Petterman was postdoc with the RAM, so he did some mathematical part with it, so there are three papers. He called it Group de Normalization. And then it was developed by Kadanov and Fischer and Wilson, and uh, it just Wilson at, at the correct moment realized how to do it so that uh, uh, it gives some physical predictions. So what uh, one must understand that um, at the time physicists were trying to look at models like easing model, it was sort of clear that they are the same at different scales. So once you are far away from scale of unlatted step, you don't really see the difference between scale of 100 atoms or 1,000 atoms. So there are some power laws that was measured experimentally. And the uh, uh, best approach to, to, to this uh, at the moment in 50s was approach of Landau or other parameter and all that. And uh, uh, so it's, he introduced some very important things which are still play important role there. But essentially, it was 
more or less giving only integer critical exponents or dimensions or rational numbers uh, of simple ways. So for thirds you can get with one Dow theory, uh, but uh, in, a, in a wrong sort of way. If, if you analyze carefully the approach, you see that in two places you, made, you make a mistake and one you uh, increase your exponent and the other decrease, but just by some miracle you get the correct answer for the for thirds. So it was clear that it's, so, so Wandao did uh, the so-called mean field theory approach where uh, you, mm, you essentially assume that uh, there is no special order. So you assume that any two atoms interact in the same way. So maybe I'll do example for thirds calculation, which is, gives correct answer later for, for self-awaiting work. But uh, it's sort of clear that it's not what actually happens in the space. And then people tried to, to do what happens in the space. And what Stuckelberg proposed is a method of normalization, which uh, basically the idea of a method that what's the problem with the easing model? Why it's so complicated? Because it has many degrees of freedom. It has many spins, uh, like square 100 by 100 has million degrees of freedom. There are a million of spins, uh, uh, well, no, 100 by 100, what, 1,000 spins, but still a lot. So the idea is that you, you, forget, you forget some degrees of freedom and you try to keep the important information in. So there are two ways to do that. Either you sort of main sp make spins uh, less, uh, less diverse. So for example, you could have had spins which are in a circle and then you forget and they become plus minus one. Uh, so this is actually the more, more interesting way. So we do this and for the MOS, but uh, uh, what is there on the picture is, is a space that uh, you forget, uh, you have geometrically say 100 by 100 square and you replace it by 25 by 25 square. So what you do, you split uh, your plane into the states voting districts four by four in this picture. And every district four by four uh, democracy holds holds primaries and votes either for uh, plus one spin or for, for, for minus one spin. Uh, and then uh, you get what? You get a new lattice with a different mesh which is different by a factor of four. Now you obviously have forgotten some information. Uh, so obviously you, you don't have bijection between these two. Uh, and uh, you can try to do bijection, but it doesn't work. I tried, it doesn't work. Uh, there are artificial models, artificial lattices like Sierpinski gaskets, where you get exact bijection when you forget degrees of freedom and you get qualitatively the same behavior and you can analyze them. But, uh, but, it's, it's, uh, uh, but uh, there is some hand waving which actually tells that qualitatively it's the same. And what actually happens is that you change lattice scale by factor of four. But uh, essentially, you have to change the temperature x. So model on a scale one inch with temperature x is mapped to model with a scale of four inches and temperature f of x, where f is some function unknown. So there is, there is some hand waving to that <coughs> effect, a very physical one. You can do mathematical one. And then what happens is that Curie point, again, this self-critical, arises as a fixed point of this renormalization transformation. So now one should uh, realize, and I stole this picture from Michael Fisher website, that uh, the space you deal with is very, very, very big. It's not just you change x on a square lattice. If you want this to work properly, you have to have space of all easing models you can imagine. So not only nearest neighbor interaction, but interaction across two points, across three points. For every specific lattice, you put hexagonal lattice, square lattice. For every lattice, you put also all possible temperatures. So this basically on, he has planes which says that for this lattice, so this is a plane of, uh, for some given lattice, so it has temperature and it has magnetic field but you also might add other parameters. But then this is a plane for different lattice with different mesh. And you also have, if you decrease mesh by four each time, you have to put the limiting thing, a lattice with mesh zero, so easing model on a plane, whatever that means. So it assignment of spins to all points in the plane. So this is already non-trivial because what is assignment of spins to all points in the plane? You take a function from the plane to plus minus one set. Now, which function? Continuous? No, continuous is not measurable or what? So it's, it's, it's a difficult question. But you imagine that there is this big space uh, and uh, then there is this renormalization uh, or normalization uh, group acting on it. Why group? Because, uh, or uh, rather it's uh, 
semi-group because you can have this 4x4 four four broken normalization, but you can also have 5x5 five five or you can have triangular normalization. So there are many transformations. And then it's a big dynamical system. So it's basically like as difficult as uh, analyzing motion of five planets. Uh, and of course, uh, as any big non-trivial dynamical systems, it have, will have some fixed points and some fixed points will be trivial, some will be non-trivial. So you expect to see everything and Cree point will, at, will arise as a non-trivial fixed point. So it's attracting on some manifold. So some points are attracted to it. It's repelling on another manifold. And for generic point, you get attracting, attracting, but then you speed off on a hyperbola. And um, I think I have the, this picture here. So what this means uh, for the, specifically for the easing model. So specifically for the easing model, I made this picture. So if you restrict it to uh, just square lattice and the temperature line, uh, basically it means that there are three fixed points. And uh, one fixed point is a frozen fixed point, which Ivan uh, Velenik with Charles Pfister can analyze very well. So if you have any subcritical temperature and you start renormalizing, so you're sending you multiply mesh of lattice by one quarter. So instead of you do this uh, map backwards, so instead of one spin, you put block four by four, and then you it so and so on. So what happens is that you just speed up to zero. So you become frozen in the limit. So the whole regime here is that the small is x is the more frozen it is, or the bigger lattice, the bigger is the piece of lattice you look at at a given x, the more frozen it is. So basically it's, the same looking at temperature, uh, say, 10 degrees Kelvin grade at a piece of lattice uh, 1,000 by 1,000, or looking at 5 degrees Kelvin grade at a small piece of lattice 100 by 100. So it's, it's basically the same. And they all tend to the frozen regime, and we know how. Now, this is the interesting point. This is actually this saddle point, which here is repelling. So it's a critical point, Curie point, and uh, uh, for 1 over 1 plus square root of 2. So it's very unstable. It's very hard to observe numerically because once you start doing computations, if, if you round up to the left or to the right, you go away by renormalization. So, so it's, it's unstable. Now there is a whole e uh, interval of positive temperature. So that, that uh, we know that it's conformally invariant. It uh, re relates to SLE, so that's, that's theory with Dimitri Now there is a whole invariant uh, interval of positive temperatures, and it has, again, a fixed point, and its fixed point corresponds to percolation, and uh, it's in the middle, so it's not uh, easy to calculate what it's, well, it's not immediately seen. So, for example, if you do, um, if you do square lattice, we don't know where it is. If you do triangular lattice, it's at point one. So the first, the critical is one over Q square root of three, and this is at point one, and it's attracting, so it's very stable. So that essentially means uh, that uh, whatever uh, you do with using model for high temperatures, spin correlations become trivial in the limit. So spins are decorrelated. But cluster properties are the same as for percolation model. So this regime is a, is a sort of big open question. So we only know it for hexagonal lattice and only exactly at this point. So if you do it for square lattice, arbitrary point of you do fix signal lattice the whole interval, it will be a very, very big theorem. It's not, it might be that it's not immensely difficult to prove. People tried, but uh, again, we are fairly new to this, so it's less than 10 years than people tried. Uh, and in principle, one can also formally put x equal infinity, and then there, there might be the fourth regime, but uh, there is some disagreement among physicists that as what do you see there, because when you formally put X well, it's, 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 it's a bit delicate. What does it mean that to formally put X infinity? Now, so this is the renormalization picture. Now, renormalization uh, is supposed to apply in any dimension, in three or four, so you're supposed to have the same picture. So it's not for two dimensions. The difference for two dimensions, for two dimensions we know exactly the values of these points and we can exactly uh, re uh, analyze these regimes. For dimension three, the current belief is that we cannot analyze them exactly, though as I said, there is a recent progress last three years for, 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 for the, for the three-dimensional easing model. Now, the two-dimensional conformal field theory it was motivated by, uh, by renormalization and started with well, the first paper was by Kadan, who was one of the key persons there. So they observed that, suppose that we have this fixed point. 
So this fixed QD point using model at critical temperature, its scaling limit, uh, if we believe in randomization mantra, it has to be scale, rotational, and translational invariant. Why? Because when we renormalize by factor of four, we still remain at this point. So it's invariant under uh, stretching by factor of four. Well, at the same by factor of two or three or whatever, any other factor. Uh, now, why it's rotationally invariant? Well, if it's not rotationally invariant, we rotate it and we get another Curie point. So there will be two Curie points for two different lights, lights and rotate lights, and it will be uh, contradictory to universal. So there are these three points. And what uh, three uh, invariances? And what people observe that if you believe in this, then two points spin to spin correlations can be calculated. So you can show that they have power law just by sort of uh, showing that they are invariant under this uh, uh, mappings. And then there was a leap of faith, uh, not particularly motivated by Polikov, who also assumed invariance under inversion. So it uh, gives you all the Möbius transformations. And this allows to calculate three-point correlations. So that uh, also uh, recently, so it's uh, Rychkov and others, was used in dimension three there. One, uh, but one has to be more careful. There, there is some covariance, so it's a bit more difficult to do. Uh, and uh, then there was the next leap of phase that uh, it's a very famous paper in 1984 by Levin, Polyakov, and uh, they assumed full conformal <coughs> invariance. So it took some time for this. It's interesting if you read their first papers, they don't immediately see the difference between Möbius invariance and full conformal invariance. And there are some mathematically inaccurate statements there, even though these people are very, very smart. But what means full conformal invariance is that if you take a piece of your model and you map it by conformal map, then you see the same picture. But you should be very careful with boundary conditions because, for example, if, you, if I take this banana-shaped region of Ising model in the plane, uh, then obviously the two ends of banana, they are geographically close, so there is some correlation here which goes through the spins outside of the banana. But if I map it to a disk, they map just to opposite points of the disk, so there is no special correlation between them. So if you want to map some domain to another domain, you should carry it with boundary conditions. You just cannot cut it out and carry it. You, sh you should specify first what are the boundary conditions. You cannot say that easing model is conformally invariant, that you cut out piece of a plane, planar easing model and map to another piece of plane, you uh, take easing model in some piece with some boundary conditions, not in full plane, and then you map it. So they, they did it uh, a bit uh, less rigorously, so they actually did full plane and some pieces of it, so it's, uh, but uh, nevertheless they, say they uh, didn't make any mistakes and they made spectacular predictions. Almost immediately, John Cardi, the same year, figured out how to do it in domains with boundary, and he specified more precisely in relation to Ising model, and unleash a flurry of activity. So there is a book, uh, collection of first papers on conformal field theory. It's 1,000 pages thick, and it covers 1984 and 1985, the first year and a half of the existence of the era. It's, it's a control. It's, it's, it's really impressive. So uh, they do, did... Uh, many, many, many things. So there are many papers which forward. So I, 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 I would say uh, a few remarks about what is conformal field theory. So there is a beautiful algebraic theory. So uh, you assume that your Ising model uh, in scaling limit has infinite number of symmetries because there are infinite number of conformal maps. So it's a very symmetric object. So you assume that its correlations then have infinite number of symmetries. It turns out that then they are related to beautiful algebraic objects, to representation theory, Verasora algebra. So correlations uh, satisfy ODEs, non-trivial ODEs. Uh, usually uh, the most interesting ones are holomorphic correlations. And then uh, you get non-trivial powers because there are non-trivial ODEs. Uh, for example, one of the predictions is the dimensional percolation cluster is almost surely 91 over 48. So there, in physics, it appears is that you do uh, you do uh, you do conformal field theory, which corresponds to percolation, uh, and then you observe that correlations belonging to the same cluster of two points. Uh, this function it satisfies some ideas, or rather, it's a holomorphic version. And then, it, since they are non-trivial, non when when you solve, you you see the drastic singularities with this this power. 
but uh, geometric and analytical parts were missing, uh, and uh, this was somehow unsatisfactory. So for mathematician reading that 91 for over 48, completely rigorous as weight in some representation of some Lie algebra. But why it should be in any way related to dimension of some fractal, it was basically unclear. Now, I, I should say that it's not as diverse as exact solvability, where really there are like uh, 10 different methods. Uh, but still, there are a couple of spin-offs of this. Uh, and um, I just mentioned two, which also give all these predictions. One appeared before conform field theory. It's due, due to two Dutch physicists, Denise and Ninhaus. And the approach is called Coulomb gas. So they write easing model as a model of loops. And they work with loops like uh, interacting gas particles, that sort of thing. So they have, uh, so did you discuss Gaussian free field in any of the courses or not yet? Yes. So the uh, logic there is basically say that if you draw all the loops in the easing model, you can look at it as a geographic map where you have these level lines, so you have to draw hills, etc. And it turns out that if you put complex weights on top of it, so before weights were real, but you change the partition function so it becomes complex. It turns out that there is a hand waving which tells you that this random landscape converges to Gaussian free field. And then Gaussian free field is easy to analyze, and then from that you get all these numbers. So this is a thing which uh, I spend a lot of time to under, trying to understand. I don't understand. Uh, they don't understand it either, so there is some leap of faith in physics, but it can be formulated very precisely is a very precise mathematical conjecture for percolation or for easing. And it's, it's a very precise conjecture that very precise thing in easing model converge to free field. So this is something which, which I mentioned is one thing one can try to prove. And then the other thing which is now also very much uh, in fashion, so it's again due to Polikov with Knizhnik and Zemochik. So instead of Belan, Polikov, Zemochik, there's Knizhnik, Polikov, Zemochik. So Knizhnik allegedly was the sort of greatest Russian physicist of 20th century, but he died of aorta aneurysm when he was a graduate student, having only written three papers. But they are cited over and over, so it's, it's you know, this, this illness where your aorta suddenly breaks. So it's, he tragically died when he was 20-something. He wrote uh, three papers and uh, so the war says that he's the only person who understood completely what is going on in this paper. Uh, so the paper says the following, that um, suppose you have some model like easing model on a flat plane on the left. Now suppose you have uh, easing model in quantum gravity, meaning easing model on a plane with random metric. So he says that then there is a precise relation between critical exponents, quadratic, on the left and on the right. So for, uh, in slightly more general but slightly less general form, it was established recently by Duplantier and Sheffield. And they established, they generalize one thing, but they generalize another. So they, it's slightly different. So their proof is, is, is easy to understand. There it's quadratic relations arises from uh, some Legendre transform. So why uh, this is helpful? Assume that we want to study random walks. If we send two random walks in the plane, it's a very difficult question whether they touch each other or not. And to solve it, you need to keep track of the whole trajectories. Now, suppose that you send them in a random plane. If they have not touched up to some moment, trajectories are not important. It's only important that they have not touched because you average over all random planes and two objects which have not touched, they just, it's the only bit of information you know if you average over all possible metrics. You don't know their distance one kilometer or one meter, you just don't know that they don't touch. So basically, if you move to random metric, it decouples different things and becomes easy to work with them. They either touch or they don't touch at all, there is no other information. So it's very easy to calculate exponents like 91 over 48 in quantum gravity on a random plane. You get much nicer <coughs> values and then by quadratic map, they moved to finding numbers like 91 over 48. So Duplantier used to this to give another derivation of all these numbers. And recently, there was a mathematical interest in random planar graphs, and there will be a course about it. So this is another approach which maybe mathematicians might, might, do, might do. So it's uh, basically, in all of this, there is lots of undone things. 
So we still don't understand mathematically some parts of conformal field theory. This we don't understand at all, though there is a very precise uh, conjecture. Well, I write it maybe in 15 minutes. And this we are starting to understand. Now this was two-dimensional conformal field theory. Now I will uh, maybe show, well, this is just uh, one more slide. So it's, it's important to know that Ising model is not conformally invariant on a lattice, because when you map a lattice, you get a curved lattice. So it's, but it's mm, conformally invariant in the scaling limit when you go very far away. So for example, uh, three-dimensional random, two-dimensional random walk, it's not conformally invariant. So I have it on square lattice, I mapped here by exponential map. Uh, obviously, you see the lattice structure. But when lattice step is very small, like in this region, you already don't see the lattice structure, and it looks like just the normal Brownian motion. So this is what we mean by conformal invariance of a lattice model, that uh, when you look from very far, far away, in the limit, it is conformally invariant. So essentially, if, 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 if lattice step tends to zero, it is conformally invariant. And what you proved in the course of Brownian motion, you proved that Brownian motion is conformally invariant. What we'll prove now in exercise, we'll prove that random walk is conformally invariant in the scaling limit, which is basically the same theorem, but slightly different proof. We'll observe that random walk is related to discrete complex analysis. And then if you pass to limit, its limit, which is Brownian motion, is related to the usual complex analysis. Now, uh, this is an example, well, since there is a Canadian quarter because it was raised from a talk given in Canada. Uh, and uh, so this is an example of, of predictions for percolation uh, that uh, Hausdorff dimension of percolation cluster is 91 over 48, Hausdorff dimension of crossing is four thirds. So we'll discuss in uh, this course uh, how these predictions are proved, or rather uh, how one proves conformal invariance, which lets us calculate things. Uh, and um, so uh, what uh, this exactly means, uh, that uh, if I take a generic uh, covering of hexagons in white and yellow, and then I put blue water on top and it seeps through, then for generic picture, uh, for a square n by n, there will be n to the power 91 over 48 blue hexagons. And the boundary of this will be n to the power 4 thirds hexagons. So for example, for books 1,000 by 1,000, 10,000. So the boundary will be rather weak. So this is actually the fractal which is there, which was there on the first slide for erosion. And this is a different model from erosion. It's a model of something seeping through uh, <coughs> random medium, but one can hand wave that two models should be qualitatively the same. And actually, there is a proof by Pierre Nolan, who is now at, uh, at uh, Teash in Zurich, uh, and that uh, act actually the boundary is the same. Now, uh, what uh, happened in the last decade, and now it's the topic of this course, that there were two developments. So one, Wendelin spoke about is schramm lover revolution. So its description of the scaling limit uh, at criticality is a couple random curve. So uh, one has to understand that uh, physicists have their own description of uh, scaling limit. It's conformal field theory. Now, conformal field theory, it's uh, not a precisely defined object in a sense. So you can either say that uh, there are several things which you can mean by this. You can mean that it's a random field, so a random distribution, a random function. Or you can mean that you just give correlations of this random function. Uh, and uh, we don't have a <laughs> mathematical theorem which says that the two things are equivalent. So the best mathematical theorem of this sort, it works only with fields which are Sobolev smooth. So it doesn't work for, for general fields of interest. So these fields are not Sobolev smooth. They are distributions at best. Now, um, what is nice about Schramm's curves, about which Wendell gave a course, is that it's a down-to-earth geometric object, which is very well defined. And now, on basis of it, we define loop ensembles and other things. Now, the other subject, and this is the subject of this course, is a discrete analyticity. So it's a way to observe this conformal invariance before passing to a limit. So uh, what we'll speak in this course about is how you see in a discrete model that it's related to complex analysis, and then how to use it to relate to proof conformal invariance or relate to SLE. Now, um, 
I don't know, I have a bunch of other slides. So Wendelin uh, spoke about the silly. So maybe I, I'll go very briefly through a few slides. So a silly was introduced by a dad who died in a tragically in a hiking accident. And uh, uh, essentially uh, what happened, it's, 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 it's a thing which is very interesting historically. So mathematicians obviously knew very much about conformal field theory. So when paper of Polyakov appeared, uh, it was immediately noticed by complex analysts who tried to approach him and discuss this, but it turned out that just people like from two different planets cannot, cannot discuss things because he formulates some physics laws uh, which we cannot transcribe into mathematical conjectures. And uh, so there were mathematicians who were working with conformal field theories on the representation theory website, but not on this fractal website. And then uh, uh, the first breakthrough happened when a group of people tried to formulate these things mathematically. So uh, Robert Langland, so this famous Langland of Langland's program fame, uh, at one point he decided to formulate a similar program for understanding field theories. So he decided to start with conformal field theory and uh, kind of uh, try to cut it into blocks which can be attacked mathematically. He first formulate some mathematical conjecture. So he wrote a half dozen papers with different authors, and in building of IMS, they published with Puyot and Santoban a very influential paper, which is a very unusual for mathematician paper. It's 80 pages, not a single theorem, only computer experiments. So he asked the question, suppose we believe in normalization groups, suppose we believe in universality, can we test it for some mathematical object? And what he suggested is to test it for percolation, for probability that there is a crossing. So you take some rectangular shape and you check the probability that there is a crossing. So they checked numerically that there is a scaling limit that if you take, so they worked with several different shapes. They checked that for all these shapes, when you send mesh of the lattice to zero, this converges or seems to converge to a different limit. That is universal, so it worked with five different lattices. The limit was always the same at criticality. And then they asked Michael Eisenman, uh, who was also at Princeton, uh, so we know that for every rectangular shape there is this probability of a crossing. So for every rectangular shape there is a number. What characterizes shapes which have the same crossing probability? And Eisenman said immediately that look, uh, it's conformal field theory, so it should be conformal modulus. So it should be that if shapes have the same conformal modulus, then they should have the same crossing probability. Now uh, uh, we'll need a bit of complex analysis, two questions. Uh, who knows uh, Riemann uniformization theorem? Like everyone probably, yes? Yeah, okay. Uh, so who, who knows what is the modulus of a rectangle? Who doesn't know what is the modulus of a rectangle? Okay, so basically uh, we know that uh, uh, every, every, sh uh, every shape can be, uh, so if I have a rectangular shape, I can map it to a disk for example, or, or to a half plane, doesn't matter. So Riemann uniformization theorem tells me that. Now uh, we have four boundary points, so they are mapped to some four points here, or four points there, if you wish. Now uh, the map to disk is not unique, because for example, disk can be rotated to the amoebus transformation, so you can play with the disk. Now uh, how many uh, what is the dimension of group of transformations of half plane? What can you do with half plane? You can shift it left to right. You can stretch it. You can also do inversion. So uh, uh, basically with half plane you, you will have uh, three real parameters. And the same with the disk. You will have three real parameters. So for the disk, all, 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 all the maps you can write, you can write as e to the power i theta, z minus a, one minus a bar z. Uh, so there, are, there is a complex number A, there is a real number theta. So there are three real parameters. So here it's always this uh, similar formula. So there are three real parameters. So you can, for example, send this for th the first three points to any points you wish. For example, here they usually send to infinity, uh, zero and one. And then there is a position of remaining point and that's called conformal modulus. 
So uh, uh, alternatively, what you can prove, maybe, oh, you know what a good thing. We will prove it as an exercise. We'll, pr we'll do it for using discrete complex analysis. We'll prove this theorem that any, any rectangular shape can be mapped to a rectangle uh, uh, one by A. And A is a conformal modulus. It's some function of this number U. So, so for every rectangular shape, there is a unique number A and a map to a rectangle one by A. So basically, uh, what turned out that it just should be a function of conformal models, and they checked it numerically, and it was true. And it was very widely read. Uh, uh, so I, I, I remember I was a graduate student, and great students in the United States, they, uh, in most universities, they have to be members of American Mass Society, so you would get this journal. So I remember that I read this paper and even tried for a week to prove this. Um, it didn't work back then. Uh, but um, what happened is that they uh, told this to John Cardi, who was a physicist, or rather Michael Eisenman did, and he immediately realized that he can, uh, uh, he can actually write a formula for probability of a connection. And he even published it before Langlands because physicists publish much faster. So this is, this is the formula. So the formula looks, um, looks a little bit scary. Uh, so probability of a crossing. So M is the model. So M is, uh, uh, is this number U, I think. Pro -pro probably, I, I, don't, I don't remember which M he used. Probably, probably that's, that's the number M. Well, it's, let me see what is M. Uh, yeah, so this is the probability of crossing. Uh, so when m equals 0, it's 0. So it's a probability of crossing between these, these two arcs. So it's between this arc and that arc. Uh, and uh, so gamma is gamma fun function. 2f1 is the hypergeometric function. So it's, it's the simplest function which doesn't have an algebraic formula. That's its definition. So it's the solu solution of a simplest uh, equation which is not uh, algebraic. And the way how uh, Cardi did this, uh, so he fixed three points. So he fixed uh, 0, 1, and infinity, and he changed the position of m. And when you change the position of m, it turns out that uh, there is a physical sense not only to crossing probability, but also to its derivative. Because what is the derivative of crossing probability? You move one point, and you had crossing, and now you don't. It means that there is a crossing which lands exactly in this small interval, and there is abstraction disallowing crossing elsewhere. So we start drawing pictures very much like Hugo in Russo Seymour Welsh theory. Uh, and uh, the equation which, which they get for crossing probability was uh, more or less of this type, like uh, derivative in m of p of m is equal to p. That, 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 that type of equation. So it's, it's a nonlinear equation. It's, it's uh, a variant of Riccati equation. And uh, it's basically the simplest algebraic equation, which doesn't have an algebraic solution. So there is a special, special name for its solution, which also can be written as an integra integral of some, some fractional polynomial. And then there was a next step that uh, Car Carlesson, uh, being complex analyst, uh, he observed that uh, this hypergeometric function also gives, uh, gives uh, a map to an equilateral triangle. So if you uniformize not, if your favorite domain is not a half plane and not a disk, but rather an equilateral triangle, you can uniformize to it. Three points go to three vertices, and then one parameter is, is here. So it turns out that probability of crossing between these two, if side length is one, and the length of this is x. So this probability is exactly x. So it tends exactly to x. Uh, and uh, that certainly made more mathematicians interested because the formula is much, much simpler. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that it sort of suggested that you should use hexagonal lattice. Now, it's, it's a red herring. You should use hexagonal lattice for a different reason. So the formula is nice in a, uh, in a uh, triangle, not because uh, hexagonal lattice is nice, but because it's a silly 6, and number 6 is related to pi over, pi over 3. 
uh, and uh, it just happens so that we can do this in hexagonal lattice, but it's not related to this formula being nice in hexagonal lattice. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a red herring, but somehow it worked. And um, what uh, uh, was a big contribution of Schramm? So let me maybe, so let's, let me maybe show uh, a few slides. Uh, so let's, let's do what? We, now go for 10 minutes, we have a short break, and then we discuss a little bit what we do in the exercises. Uh, so, um, so what uh, Schramm realized is that uh, just getting probability of crossing is probably not enough. It's better to get some more interesting object. And he suggested to study, so this actually slide from his first talk about the silly, study this red curve which separates uh, white hexagons from gray hexagons. So you basically do some domain, you put the Abrusian boundary condition like in the easy pictures before, and then there is a unique curve which separates white and black. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, he did, uh, he proved in his first paper about this, a lemma, uh, so it's, it's a bit buried in the paper because the paper is 80 pages long and there is a two-page lemma which is absolute gem. So he proved that it has to be, uh, if a belief is the Nesili curve. So now, uh, Lovner revolution, so I don't know how much Werner got into the details on Lovner revolution. So Lovner revolution was, uh, is, is a way uh, to um, see how conformal map to domain changes if you draw a slit through a domain. So it, as the name suggests, it was uh, invented by Karl Lovner. Uh, and it was invented to solve Bieberbach's conjecture. So Bieberbach's conjecture says that if you have a map of unit disk in the plane A n z n, and you normalize that first coefficient is one, then A n's coefficient is no more than n. So second coefficient is no more than two was proved by, uh, uh, by Bieberbach uh, using area consideration. And Lovner proved using Lovner revolution uh, A3 no more than three. Now, how you prove it that A3 no more than three, it's, it's uh, basically you take a map which has the biggest coefficient A3. Now it means that whatever you cut away, A3 only decreases. So you write variation of A3 under cutting away and it should decrease, uh, so, so it cannot increase. So basically first variation is zero, second variation is negative. So it gives you two uh, one identity, one inequality. And it turns out that from them you can deduce that A3 is no more than three. So it's, uh, and the paper was what uh, Bieberbach was uh, editor of Math Mathematician Annal and so excited that he thought that in no time Lovner will prove other coefficients. So he added number one to the title of the paper. And Lovner never ever returned to this subject, but uh, Louis de Branche, uh, he eventually, 60 years later, he proved uh, this using Lovner revolution. Well, rather, people using Lovner revolution reduced it to another conjecture, and he proved this other conjecture. But Lovner revolution still is the central subject there. So uh, now, uh, uh, what the Schramm Lovner revolution is the same thing, uh, uh, but uh, you do a random curve. So basically, Lovner evolution was uh, given by this equation, so which Wedeln has written. Yes. So. Uh, and uh, Schramm SLE is uh, what happens if you put a, <laughs> a fractal thing here. So the uh, uh, Schramm's uh, logic, uh, so let, let, yeah, okay, so it's Wendell's lecture there, I will skip through this very fast, was basically the following, that you draw a slit and you want to describe it. So you stop at epsilon capacity increments and you do successive maps which map from here to here to here. So uh, the maps are, let's say, j epsilon of different colors. And each of them you expand at infinity. So we're dealing with half plane case. Lovner was dealing with a disk near center. We deal with half plane near infinity, we expand. And if you compose such maps, you notice that the first three coefficients, so first two coefficients, they, they are additive. So uh, some of these coefficients give us this and some of these gives us that. Coefficients later, they, they satisfy complicated formulas, but first, first to edit, if you can see this using uh, formal power series, so informal, and uh, because you can write estimates. And then uh, what it means that if we have random 
independent maps, like physicists led us to believe with conformal field theory. It means that this driving force, U, can be split into independent identical increments, which means that it is a Brownian motion. So essentially, this is the whole proof of uh, Schramm of this lemma, which says that if you, if you have a curve which is a random conformally invariant curve, uh, then it has to be described by Lovner relation with Brown in motion driving force, because driving force can be split into increments which are identically distributed and independent. So essentially, if you take Brown in motion and you put it on top of Lovner revolution, you get SLE, which is Brown in motion on the modular space of Riemann surfaces. So in this case, it's an easy one. It's a disk or a half plane, trivial models. But you, for example, can take uh, some donut with several holes, and you start cutting model with changes, so you get uh, Brown in motion there. So this, this is this great lemma of Schramm, and uh, then you can study this. Well, this is the actual proof, which Wendelin you must, must have shown. But then you can uh, prove different theorems. So this is example of theorems which, which uh, uh, Wendelin must, must have mentioned. Now, uh, what we will be speaking about, we'll be speaking about two things. We'll be speaking about which lattice models, how uh, conformal invariants arise in lattice models and how they are related to a silly. So this is, this is uh, an example for the easing model. So if we take the picture of the easing model, which we have seen before, only here somehow I went from one corner to another. So this curve interface at criticality will converge to a silly 3. And it's a fractal curve of dimension 11 over 8. If you do the same in random cluster version of Ising model, I didn't draw random clusters because they are, the picture gets rather fuzzy, I just draw the curve, then you get a curve which touches itself, so it's actually a simple curve which touches itself and bounces off dimension 5 thirds. Then um, there are other things, so for example there is a percolation where you um, have dimension 7 quarters again touch itself. Or this is an example, uniform spanning tree. Now, uniform spanning tree, was it mentioned in one of the courses or not? Yes. So there it's a space filling curve because space, uh, so it's Haskell's dimension two. So there are still some open things. So for example, there is this sort of universality. If you take a percolation cluster here and its outer boundary, or Brownian curve, its outer boundary, or self avoiding walk, they are all supposed to be SLA thirds. And for the first two, we know how to prove that it's SLA thirds. For the third one, we don't know. Now, uh, so what we'll try to do, we'll try to outline the proofs of these two theorems. But before, uh, uh, we'll before we prove that something is related to SLA, which allows to do calculations with SLA, you need to observe some conformal uh, invariance on a lattice, or rather some complex analysis on a lattice. Now, uh, what is the discrete complex analysis? So in this setting, it was introduced by Rick Kenyon for dimers. And essentially, there are uh, two steps. You find some object in your model, which is discrete harmonic or discrete analytic. Now, discrete harmonic functions, most people have seen, those are just functions on a graph which have mean value property. Now, discrete analytic is slightly more subtle, but uh, essentially discrete analytic functions already are in the book of Kirchhoff on electrical networks. So we have le electric networks and a flow or a flow liquid on some pipe system and it satisfies two Kirchhoff laws that amount of liquid flowing from a joint is zero. So then amount which flows in flows out is zero. And th there are no circles, uh, the amount flowing around an, a phase is zero, so we are in a plane. So the second means that you can build a perpetual mobile uh, because uh, if you put turbine here, it won't rotate because it cancels out. So these two things, uh, they exactly correspond to two Cauchy-Riemann equations. Or they correspond, in a sense, to a vector field which is here, uh, drawn here to be uh, curve-free and divergence-free. So what you do, you observe that there is some probabilistic object which satisfies these things. Then you prove that it converges to um, continuous object, which is harmonic or analytic. And this allows you to prove conformal invariance because harmonic functions or analytic functions are conformally invariant. If you take harmonic functions, you map it by conformal map, or analytic functions map by conformal map, they're still harmonic or analytic. 
For example, this is one of the reasons why Brownian motion is conformally invariant. And then you can relate to SLE or you can calculate things. Now uh, I want to finish here. I will show you just a couple of pictures. Let me maybe show you pictures. So this is, this is an example of how you can represent. So this, this is a graph where two Kirchhoff laws are satisfied. So you see there is 25 here, 16 here, and 9 here. So 25 goes counterclockwise and 16 plus 9 clockwise. So 25 minus 9 minus 16 is equal to 0. So Brooks, Smith, Stone, and Tutt observe that uh, you can geometrically represent this graph as a square tiling, where every vertex corresponds to horizontal edge. So red one to red one, blue one to blue one. And every edge corresponds to a square whose size is exactly the number written on this edge. So uh, this is another relation to what I called, which, what I mentioned, random graphi gra graphs and planar maps inside a plane. So basically, discrete function on a con analytic function on a graph can be geometrically represented as a square tiling. Yeah, by the way, I, I need to say that it's essentially analytic function. It's not a square tiling, it's a graph. And then this graph is mapped by square talentus. So basically, if you want to have a conformal map in a discrete version, you have to have two square tilings which have the same topology, and one is mapped to another. So essentially, square tiling is a discrete way to, to do conformal geometry. And uh, well, this is an example of a square tiling of a square. So they were trying to solve a question whether such exists. But there are other things. For example, people are also working with a, circle uh, packings uh, and it's it's also a discrete version of a geometry so here for example is a conformal map of a half disk on a disk realized with a circle packing and here it's a regular one and it's mapped here or here there are uh, pictures two more pictures of square tiles in the picture of a conformal homomorphic motion of a square tiling stolen from Rick Kenny's web page so uh, mm, what uh, these pictures are about is that uh, these discrete as, as conformal maps, you can think of them geometrically, as, like lines going to lines. Uh, also, discrete, uh, discrete conformal maps or discrete analytic functions also can be thought of geometrically as, for example, a pair of square tilings would give you a conformal map from one to another if, if they have the same topology. OK, so maybe I will finish here uh, now what was, let me just, uh, blah, 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 here, uh, yeah. So that's basically the goals of the course. Uh, so we'll do discrete complex analysis, and then we'll do uh, three or four of the following act, uh, items. So uh, either we'll work out uniform spanning tree, or the Minot tilings, how discrete analytic functions arise there. Then work percolation hexagonal lattice. Then there is a model which was introduced by Sheffield Schramm, which is artificially created so that it is conformally invariant. Uh, then we'll speak about easing and FK easing, and maybe by self avoiding work where we don't, uh, <coughs> don't really have full analyticity, but still we can deduce a few things. Now, uh, it's, it's an area where there are many open questions. So it's uh, not, uh, it's something where there are many problems which can be attacked, and some of them are obviously difficult, and I wouldn't, for example, try to build rigorous normalization theory alone because it's just a big, uh, a big thing. But for example, we uh, proving conformal invariance for self-avoiding walk or percolation with square edges, it might turn out to be uh, that there is a short ingenious proof everyone has overlooked. It's not totally out of questions. And uh, developing rigorous theory of 2D quantum gravity, it's random models on random quadrant graphs. Also, there is lots of progress here uh, now, and there will be next course about that. That's also something where some things uh, might, 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 might be not so difficult. And understanding coal gas, also, it's, it, it might be a fairly a fairly easy thing, and maybe I'll just, an example of this, just uh, just a very, very easy conjecture. So let me draw a 
has Hugo or Ivan mentioned six vertex model? No? Yes? So just draw six vertex model. So we draw some configuration of, uh, of arrows on a square lattice. Mm, and um, yeah, whatever. Uh, so it's clear that, and then we, sh we should uh, tell what is the weight, what is the weight of different error configurations. So uh, uh, basically there are two types of vertices. There is this type of vertex, and there are four, four of those. Let's say that the weight is, uh, so usually weights of these four types are denoted A1, A2, B1, B2. Uh, so it's A1, uh, A2, B1, B2. Let's suppose that they are all equal to 1. And then there are two vertices like this. Their weight is C1, C2. Let's say that both of them are equal to U. And let's say that U is, belongs to uh, square root of 2 to 2. So if we are in this range, H such model gives us a random height function. Because if I put, uh, so you have a random function, when you cross a line, you increase or decrease by 1. So if you cross like that, it's you increase. If you cross like that, you increase. If you cross like that, you decrease. If you cross like that, you decrease. So this, this is just a height function. So it's basically uh, H h plus 1, or if it's the other way around, h, h minus 1. So for these parameter values, this h converges to Gaussian free field for the whole interval of parameter values. And this interval of parameter values, it covers uh, many models from percolation to easing and to UST. And uh, if, for example, one proves this, one can prove all or, or one can deduce from this all, all the dimensions for all for the whole spectrum of models, percolation, easing, everything. And it sounds sort of not, not there, there might be something, some, some easy approach to it. OK, so uh, let's say I stop here. Uh, we have next lecture on Monday, which is, uh, which is very close. And then we'll start with the discrete complex analysis, but maybe half of it will be given today as an exercise, and we'll discuss it in detail on Monday. So it's, uh, yeah.